computer. All right, everybody, we are recording with Kelly Miller Halls. My name is uh, Katie, and I work for the Spokane Public Library. I'm a youth services librarian, and today we um, are going to be working with mythological mysteries with Kelly Miller Halls. And so, welcome, Kelly. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to have a fun time talking about six mythical creatures, mythical mysteries, animals that were never real but animals we wish were real. We're gonna talk about some of the stories that come with those six creatures. Even though they're way more than six, I had to carve it down to six. And we're gonna talk about some of the stories that are connected to them. So are you ready to talk mythical mysteries? Yay, say yes, thumbs up if you agree. Hooray. So I'm going to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint with great images for you because it's way more fun to have pictures than just some lady talking. So we're gonna share it there. And then we're going to start the slideshow. Six mythical mysteries, as promised. Animals that never existed with me, Kelly Miller Halls. I am a children's writer. I write nonfiction for kids. I studied journalism in college, and it turned out grown ups are too boring. So I decided to write for kids. I do not have a mythical animal book out yet, but. I decided to do this presentation for the summer reading program. And I'm so glad I did because there are so many cool things to discover. Now, these are the six we're going to talk about. Dragon, Unicorn, Mermaid, Centaur, Pegasus, and Griffin. I don't know why PowerPoint puts strange images with my creatures. A mermaid is not a seal. A centaur is not a dinosaur. A griffin is not a cat. And a pegasus is not a north star. But for some reason, PowerPoint put those with the name. So these are the six, and we're going to start with one of my favorites, dragons. Do you love dragons too? I do. This was supposed to be a live presentation where I could bring things for you to touch. So I have all kinds of cool toys. Here is my toy dragon. He is a forest dragon. Isn't he handsome? I wish you could touch him. That's why I bought him. So you could touch him and march him around. But COVID-19 got in our way, so we're going to virtually share our things. This is the dragon I brought for you to touch. Now, where did dragon stories begin? One source I found said they started in the Roman Empire in 120 AD. Rome was the king of the whole world. They took over just about every part of Europe, and they started telling dragon stories. There was a Roman teacher, his name was Pliny the Elder. This is his drawing. Aren't you glad your name's not Pliny? Pliny's a little bit weird. But Pliny the Elder was a Roman author and teacher, and he believed that dragons were real. He called them giant snakes that ate people. I'm not sure that's a dragon. I think that's a giant snake. But that's what Pliny said. He said that's where the dragon story started. Pliny the Elder said they were giant snakes that ate people whole, just swallowed them up like an egg. But he's not the only guy talking about dragons. Dragons were everywhere. Every country in the world had their own dragon legends. There were dragons in China, and dragons in Europe, and dragons in all kinds of places, even in the Americas before we even knew what the Americas were. There were dragon stories everywhere, as you can see from this dragon map. Everywhere, dragon legends. Now, one of the legends was from 12th century English, England. Uh, it was the tale of Geoffrey of Monmouth. Now, King Vortigern was the king of the land, and he was told a war was coming. And if he wanted to win the war, he would have to kill a little boy. I think that's bad advice. And the little boy thought it was bad advice too. So when they grabbed up this little boy, he said to the king, no, 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 don't kill me. You need to free the dragons and they'll fight to decide who wins the war. And the king said, dragons, what dragons are you talking about? And the boy said, there are two dragons buried right here in a cavern. And if you dig them up, they will fight. And if the white dragon wins, 
then your enemy will win. And if the red dragon wins, then you will win. So the king said, boy, there better be dragons here or it's off with your head. So he dug where the boy told him, and he found two dragons. And the dragons fought a fierce battle and the red dragon won. And so the king knew he was going to win the war. So he went to fight. He was very brave because he said, I got this thing in the bag. And he did win the war. Now, that was not a true story. That was fiction. I write nonfiction, true stories. That was not a true story. That was a made up story just for fun. But it was kind of a cool story and an early story from the 12th century, 1100s. Now, there was a famous writer. His name was J.R.R. Tolkien. And Tolkien wrote famous books. They had dragons in them, some of them. Now this guy is not Tolkien, really. This is an actor. This actor's name, Nicholas Holt. But he played Tolkien in the movie. And he, Tolkien, was a famous writer. These were Tolkien's books. He did the Lord of the Rings books and he did The Hobbit. And you might have seen the Lord of the Rings movies on TV. Well, in The Hobbit movies, there was a famous dragon and the dragon was named Schmaug. Not smog, not like dirty air. Schmaug. It's hard to say, isn't it? Schmaug. Smaug was a dragon, the fiercest dragon in all of Tolkien's world, and he liked to gather gold. This was a drawing that Tolkien did himself of his famous dragon, Smaug. And you see that hill of gold and gems and diamonds and rubies? He stole all that stuff from human beings. And you see at the bottom of the hill of gold are some skeletons, just like Halloween. Yeah, he ate the people that tried to come in and steal his gold. And that was the drawing that J.R. Tolkien did himself of his dragon Schmaug. But in the movie, the Hobbit movies, Schmaug is even more impressive. Are you ready to see what Schmaug looked like in the movie? Here we go, ready? Oh, isn't he amazing? An actor called Benedict Cumberbatch did the voice of Schmaug, and he was an amazing dragon. Now in this picture, Schmaug is not sitting on his own gold pile. He stole a gold store from the dwarves. The dwarves lived underground and they mined the earth for valuable things, including gold. And they had rooms full of gold. So Schmaug took over their castle. And in this picture, he's laying with the dwarf gold. Isn't that a lot of gold? I love that dragon. He's one of my favorite dragons of all time. Now here's my other favorite. This is Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. There's a whole bunch of books you can check out at the library, and I know it's closed, but they have a curbside service, and you can say, I want to check out the Toothless books, and they will help you do it. They'll put it in your car. But his name is Toothless. They thought he had no teeth, and it turned out he did. He was called a Night Fury Dragon. And this is from the third How to Train Your Dragon movie. Do you see the little girl in the back? She's called a light fury, and they get married in the movie. Spoiler, but it's wonderful. It won't ruin the movie. They fall in love. My favorite dragon of all time. Now, I have one more dragon thing to share with you before we start talking about unicorns, and that is this. This is a make-believe dragon skull. The bones of the head, do you see it? Look at his beautiful teeth. You were supposed to be able to touch this. That was the point of having it, is for you to be able to touch it. But we'll have to wait until another time for you to touch it. Maybe when things clear up and COVID's gone, 
I'll bring it all so you can play with it. Does that sound good? We'll go to the library together. Now let's talk about the unicorn. I have a unicorn skull too. Do you want to see it? <gasps> Look at the little unicorn skull. See his golden horn? It's copied after a horse's skull and they just put the gold horn on it. Because unicorns were never real, but they're super awesome, aren't they? I love unicorns. By the way, my friend Rick Spears did the drawings for these all of these six um, mythical creatures. Aren't they beautiful? They're very beautiful. Now, these unicorns were described by the Greeks. And it was a Greek historian called Thasius. His name is very hard to say because of that CT is weird. But it was Thasius. And Thasius lived in 400 BC, 400 years before Jesus was born. And he said unicorns were real. And this is how he described them. He said they were about the size of a horse. He said they had a white body, purple head, blue eyes, a long horn that was red at the tip, black in the middle, and white at the base. Now, I couldn't find any unicorns that looked like that. Nobody I could find had drawn a unicorn the way Theseus had described them. So I used this picture instead because I really like this picture. This is a tapestry. That means it's a cloth that people hung on the walls. So somebody had to weave every single detail of that picture into a piece of fabric, cloth. Now this was woven in 1495 in the Netherlands and it's called the Unicorn in Captivity because that unicorn is trapped in a corral. But I used to have a horse and my horse could break out of any wooden corral I put her in. So if that unicorn wants out, that unicorn will escape. So he's not really in captivity. He's just hanging out for a while. I love that picture, don't you? Now, there are other unicorns we want to talk about. Here is a unicorn drawing that came from 1607. Isn't it weird? It's a, it's a pen and ink drawing. And they even spell unicorn differently there. See, it's spelled instead of U-N-I-C-O-R-N, it's spelled V-N-I-C-O-R-N-E. And a guy named Edward Topsell, he drew this unicorn in 1607. I like this drawing. I think it's weird and I like weird stuff. Now, there's a movie that came out in 1940 from Walt Disney and it was called Fantasia. And Fantasia was cartoons set to classical music like Mozart's music and then the cartoons were to complement the music. And guess who was in Fantasia? Yep, unicorns. Look at those cute little baby unicorns. Aren't they adorable? In Fantasia, they're dancing around on Mount Olympus. That's the place where the gods live, Zeus and all those gods. And Zeus got mad and he started throwing thunderbolts. And so the little unicorns hide, they're so scared. But when the storm ends, they come back out and they dance around again. It's pretty great. And it's set to Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. It's really neat. It's probably on Netflix or maybe Disney Plus. So watch Fantasia. It's really fun. And it doesn't take a lot of concentrating. Now, here's one of my favorite unicorn movies. It's called The Last Unicorn. One of my favorites. Isn't the unicorn beautiful in that cartoon? Here's another picture of her. Her voice was done by an actress named Mia Farrow. You don't know who she is, but ask your grandma. She'll know who Mia Farrow was. And she did the voice of the last unicorn. Isn't it a beautiful way to draw a unicorn? Now, do you know who Tom Cruise is? Tom Cruise is an action hero. He was in a movie called Top Gun. And then he was in all these action movies, the Mission Impossible movies, the Mummy movie, the Jack Reacher movies, day and night and day, all the right moves. He's an action hero. 
But his very first movie was not action. His very first movie was a unicorn movie. And it was called Legend. Tom Cruise was only 22 years old. He was a baby. And this is what he looked like. And in the movie, he saved a princess. But he also saved a unicorn. But it's a little bit scary movie. It took me about four times to watch it before I could make it to the end. It just scared me. It was a little bit scary. But it was also a little bit great. Tom Cruise saving a unicorn. Now, I forgot to show you my unicorn. Would you like to see the unicorn you were supposed to touch? Here she is. Isn't she beautiful with the flowers in her mane? I wish you could gallop her around. Soon, perhaps. Now, let's talk about mermaids. Here's the mermaid you're supposed to get to touch. Isn't she cute? She's got crazy hair because she lives underwater. She is a mermaid with her beautiful flippery tail. Mermaids are one of my favorite mythical creatures. They're not real, but I think it'd be cool if they were. People love mermaids. The very first mermaid stories came from the Middle East, a country called Syria. And it started in 1000 BC, a thousand years before Jesus was born. The story goes like this. There was a goddess named Adagatus, and Adagatus fell in love with a human boy. She was so in love with this boy, but it was against the rules. And she accidentally killed this human boy. And she was so sad that she threw herself into the ocean. And she turned into a mermaid. That's how the story goes. And then you know what they started doing in Syria? They started putting mermaids on their coins. Now, can you see my cursor circling around the face of this coin person? This is a Syrian coin. And if you go all the way down to here, do you see her little mermaid tail? That's a mermaid on the Syrian coins. And this is another mermaid on a Syrian coin. Now don't tell me I'm crazy. I know this is a lion. But riding on the lion's back is a unicorn from the sea. I mean, a mermaid from the sea. Her tail doesn't look very flippery, but she's a mermaid too. Mermaids were on their money, which would be really fun. I wish we had a, mer a mermaid quarter. Wouldn't that be neat? Now, here's another mermaid, but it was never, ever real. It's not even close to real. A guy named P.T. Barnum said, come and see my beautiful mermaid. You went to his circus and you saw this horrible, ugly creature, half a monkey, sewn to half a fish and mummified. It was a fake mermaid called the Fiji mermaid. And you may have heard of P.T. Barnum from the movie, The Greatest Showman. Remember his name was Phineas? It wasn't F. Phineas, it was P.H. Phineas. P. Phineas T. Barnum. That movie was about P.T. Barnum, the guy that had the Fiji mermaid. Isn't that fun? He has a connection to mermaids. Now, this is another Disney movie called Peter Pan. It came out in 1953, and yep, there were mermaids in Peter Pan. Aren't they cute? They have little seashells and little flowers. They are mermaids from 1953. But that's not the only Disney mermaid. No, there was Splash. Splash was a live action Disney movie. It starred this girl, her name is Daryl Hannah, and a famous actor called Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks was a man that the mermaid fell in love with. And she decided to make Tom Hanks into a mermaid. Isn't that a beautiful mermaid costume? I love it. Now, one more Disney mermaid we can't forget. And that is the little mermaid, Ariel. We couldn't talk about mermaids without talking about her. She's probably the most famous mermaid ever. There's going to be a live action Little Mermaid. Did you know that? Guess what? I'm so excited. The new live action Little Mermaid Ariel will be black. It'll be so beautiful to have a beautiful black mermaid. An African American mermaid. I can't wait. I think she's going to be wonderful. Just as good as the cartoon Ariel. Another mermaid just for us to love. 
Now, this is what mermaids might have been in real life. The sailors on the ocean were seeing something with a flippery tail, but it probably wasn't a half human, half fish. It may have been a sea lion because sea lions have those big brown eyes and a very flippery tail. So maybe mermaids are actually sea lions, but there's another theory, another thought of what mermaids might be. They might be sea cows, also known as manatees. Manatees are related to elephants, believe it or not. Aren't they adorable? They're the cutest little chubby guys I've ever seen in my life. Sea cows, manatees, but they have a flippery tail. And some people think that the sailors saw the flipper of a manatee and thought they'd seen a mermaid. Here is an article from a newspaper in 1889 explaining that mermaids aren't real, they're manatees. And this drawing was by a guy named Miss Quoid. That's a weird name, Miss Quoid. But he drew this mermaid with the manatee. I think his manatee's a little off. He has a kind of a pig nose. Manatees don't have a pig nose. Look, manatees have that nose. Not that nose. Our next creature is the centaur. Want to see the centaur you were supposed to touch? Here it is. This is a warrior centaur with a shield and a big club. He's got armor on. Centaurs are amazing. There are a lot of horsey mythical creatures in this because I love horses. So what is a centaur? It's a half man, half horse. Really, it's probably a third man, two thirds horse. It goes only above the waist and the head is the human and the rest is horse. Centaurs are kind of amazing. They were on money too. In Greek mythology, the centaur's father was a king and the centaur's mother was a cloud a fluffy white cloud that's a magical piece of parents huh if your mom was a cloud do you think you might be a centaur too maybe that's what the story was that's the story in 182 bc and this money has a centaur on it i wish i could have all of these coins don't you I would love to have them. I have one and I'll show it to you in a minute. Now, here are some more centaurs. These were created in Rome. It was called a mosaic. It was created in the second century. It's now in a museum in France. But do you see each of those little blocks? See each of the little squares in the picture? See there's like tiny squares, like Legos almost, or like little bricks. Every single one of those little squares was put on by hand, one at a time. It probably took a year to make this mosaic of two centaurs with each little tiny square of ceramics. Isn't it beautiful? I would like to go to France to see this. That is a beautiful pair of centaurs. Now I have one more centaur for you. Oh, I have more than one, I forgot. Remember that Fantasia movie I told you about from 1940 that was all classical music? Yep, they had centaurs in that movie too. They're kind of beautiful centaurs, aren't they? So watch that movie. Did you know Harry Potter had centaurs? In the book and in the movies. This is the forbidden forest. The centaurs are defending their homeland in this picture. Centaurs and Harry Potter. I love that they borrowed mythical animals for those books. Now, here's a very cool centaur skeleton. And it looks very real, doesn't it? But it's not. It's a human and a Shetland pony. And it's on display at a library at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Wouldn't you like to go to that library to see that skeleton of a centaur? It's not real, but it was made to look real. They wanted people to believe centaurs were real, and then they wanted to say, don't believe everything you see. Not every story you read on the internet is true, so look for evidence before you believe it. Be a critical thinker. Now, it's on display at the university, but this is the man who created it. 
he was an art, a professor um, from the University of Wisconsin. He made this skeleton in 1980, half a human and half a Shetland pony. Do you see my cursor here? It's floating around on the man's shirt. Well, follow me over. Look right there. Do you see the drawing? There's the plan for his fake centaur skeleton. And people loved it. It was at his college and then it went to the T Tennessee college. And then this guy, he contacted people that make skeletons professionally. Let's say you have to study a horse skeleton because you want to be a veterinarian. You don't have to look at a real horse skeleton. You can look at an exact copy. And there's a company that makes those copies. And that company is called Skulls Unlimited. So that professor called up Skulls Unlimited and said, here's my plan, here's my fake one. Can you make one that looks totally realistic? One that looks like it's mounted like a dinosaur. So they made it for him. And it is beautiful, isn't it? And you can go and see it at Tucson's International Wildlife Museum, Tucson, Arizona. So if you ever go to Arizona, go and see this beautiful fake centaur skeleton. Isn't that cool? Now, here's the anatomy of a centaur. It's just a drawing because they're not real. But if they were real, the lungs would be here and the heart would be here and the stomach would be here and the intestines and stuff would be in the horse body. This is what it would look like if it was real. Here's our next creature. Our next creature is amazing. It is called a griffin. And here's the griffin you were supposed to be able to touch. Look at those golden wings. He's very handsome. You can touch him another time. Now we'll talk about the griffin. There are two ways to spell griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N or G-R-Y-P-H-O-N. Either is correct. And the griffin is an ancient creature too, also from the Middle East. He came from the Middle East in 600 BC, 600 years before Jesus was born. This is a bronze sculpture of a griffin. And it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. If you ever wanna to go to New York City, you can see this griffin in that museum. Now here's a coin. I know I keep coming back to the money, but there are griffins on coins. They were stamped into the ancient coins just like that unicorn, just like that centaur, just like that mermaid. Here is the griffin stamped into the coin, half lion, half eagle. Now here's another one. Supposedly, the talons could detect poison. So if you got bit by a snake, that griffin could tell what poison had hurt you and most of the talons were not real. Some people said, I have a real griffin talon right here in my hand. And when the scientist looked at what he had in his hand, it wasn't a griffin talon because griffins aren't real. It was an antelope horn. It's not even shaped like a talon. The talon is this part of the feet. See the feet and they look like eagle feet. Those are the talons, the sharp parts. Does that look like an antelope horn? No, not at all. This drawing was drawn in 1663. Now here's another griffin, isn't it beautiful? Some people said griffins were super kind and protective of human beings. Other people said they were selfish and mean. I like to think they were kind because I like kind animals. And most animals will be nice as long as you're not mean to them. But don't ever try it with a bear. That would be a bad idea. If they're afraid of you, they might be scared. Now here's a picture of a griffin from India. India believed in griffins too. Pliny the Elder. Remember that Pliny guy? Pliny, the weird name? He said griffins laid their eggs in nests. And if you could find their nests, you would find gold nuggets 
hidden in the nests. So people were always on the lookout for griffin nests so they could collect the gold. I don't think they ever found it because there aren't any real griffins. They're make-believe, but they're beautiful, aren't they? Now, I have a friend named Adrienne Mayer. She studies ancient mythology, and she thinks griffins might actually have been dinosaur skeletons because some dinosaurs have a beak. This dinosaur here, do you see my cursor on the dark brown dinosaur? See, he has a beaky kind of nose. That's Protoceratops. And that dinosaur was first found in China, where they have lots of mythical animals. She thinks they found this and they made up the griffin based on this skeleton. Or the Cidosaur, who also has that beaky kind of nose. That's possible. Now, this is Buckbeak. Buckbeak is from the Harry Potter movies and books. Now, Buckbeak is not a griffin. Buckbeak is a hippogriff. But he was inspired by the griffin. Instead of being half eagle and half lion, he's half eagle and half horse. And he's my favorite Harry Potter creature ever. I wish I could have a Buckbeak. And here's Harry Potter making friends with that. Buckbeak, inspired by the griffin. Isn't that cool? Now, Pegasus. I love Pegasus. Here is the figure of Pegasus you are supposed to get to play with. And you will get to play with it someday, I promise. Isn't he beautiful? I love Pegasus. Now, Pegasus is also has an interesting story. He was created in Greek mythology, and they said Pegasus was the son of Poseidon. Poseidon was the god of the sea. Remember he had the Triton? Like Ariel's dad, Pegasus was supposedly the son of Poseidon. And a hero captured Pegasus. It was a monster killer hero. His name was Belerf Bellerophon, and Bellerophon captured the Pegasus using a magic golden bridle. And if you don't know what a bridle is, if you've ever seen a horse, and maybe you've even ridden a horse, you know how you hold the reins and there's a thing in the horse's mouth? Well, that's a bridle. See this part here? That's the magic bridle, golden magic bridle. He threw that magic bridle on Pegasus and Pegasus had to do what he said. And he said, Pegasus, we're gonna go and we're gonna kill the chimera. Do you know what a chimera is? This is a chimera. That's your bonus number seven mythical creature. A chimera, a three-headed monster. That monster killer wanted to get this chimera and he wanted to kill him, so Pegasus helped him. Here's a painting of him, Bellerophon, killing the chimera. And he did kill him. He was very successful at it, thanks to Pegasus. And then he said, I'm such a good monster killer. I want to be a god. Pegasus, fly me up to Mount Olympus, where the gods live. And Pegasus had no choice. He had to do it because the golden bridle was still on him. So he flew him all the way up to Mount Olympus, but it made the gods really mad. So they killed that monster hunter. Bellerophon died. And then they turned him in to a constellation, a collection of stars in the heavens. At least he got to be a constellation. Now they didn't punish Pegasus because it wasn't his fault. They said, okay, Pegasus, you get to carry the thunderbolts of Zeus now. So he carried them for the great god Zeus. These are all stories that are not true. They are stories that are fiction, but they're fun stories. And Pegasus, yes, is also on Greek money. Yes, I want this coin so badly. So I did a search on the internet and I found a copy, a rep. It's not the real coin. It says a copy of the coin. And I bought one. And doesn't it look neat? 
There it is right there, the Pegasus coin. Here's what it looks like on the other side. It's a goddess. But Pegasus was on the coins too, isn't that amazing? There is not the only thing Pegasus is on. Remember that Fantasia movie from 1940 with classical music? Yep, they had Pegasus in that too. The mom and the dad, and you see the little ones trying to keep up behind. Yeah, watch that Fantasia movie. I think you might love it. Now, Pegasus was also in the Disney movie called Hercules. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's wonderful. This is the first time Pegasus met the baby Hercules. They're just little baby Hercules and little baby Pegasus in this picture, but they grew up and they were still best friends. Grown up Hercules, grown up Pegasus. They love being friends. Now those are the six mythical animals we're going to talk about today. But I don't want you to think they're the only mythical animals. There are hundreds and hundreds of mythical creatures from every continent in the world. This is a map, a poster, with just a few of the mythical animals from every country. Are there only one or two or three or six? There are hundreds and this is not complete. I hope after we finish today, you will go and search for your own mythical creatures. Or maybe you can make up a mythical creature of your own. If you made a mythical animal, what characteristics would you give it? Would it, you make it with wings so it could fly? Would you make it so it could swim underwater? Would you make it so it could be invisible? Maybe you'd make it mean or maybe you'd make it magical. If it's mythical made up, it can be anything your mind thinks of. You can make up the story you like best. But you don't have to stick to these mythical animals. Look, there are many, many dragons in mythology. There are many, many supernatural beings in ancient Egypt. These are just a few. And in the middle, those are my favorites, cryptozoology, the mythical animals of the United States and other places like Bigfoot and the Loveland Frog and the Chupacabra. There are legendary animals everywhere. So I hope you'll think about looking up mythical creatures of your own. And I hope you got your coloring sheets. My friend Rick Spears drew all of these beautiful drawings for my slides, but he also made two coloring sheets for you. So you can color them any way you want. And you can't be wrong because they're mythical. So they can be any colors you want. Now, this is not all. If you've tuned in today, you are lucky because you will win a prize, two prizes. If you go to your branch of the library, call first, make sure your branch has them. Each person who attended this program will win a teeny tiny Pegasus and a teeny tiny unicorn. Again, I thought that I was going to see you in real life and I could hand you these beautiful creatures of your own, but now you'll pick them up curbside. Each one of you gets each little creature. So you get two prizes and one lucky winner that the librarian will draw from the names of the people who came will win this prize, but only one. All of you get these, but only one gets the happy dragon. Yes, one of you will get a happy dragon to watch over your room. So does anybody have any questions? Anybody want to talk to me? Let's turn off the slideshow and let's talk. I need to stop sharing. There. Now, can we mute, unmute these people and can I see them? Yeah. Let's or see. should we stop recording first? Maybe we should stop recording. And we can I hope you enjoy this recording if you're <laughs> to get on YouTube. And um, I hope maybe someday I'll get to come back so we can do more. There'll be other subjects, but thank you for coming and think of mysterious animals of your own.
Yeah. And also be sure to get your summer reading packets uh, today for, to get those coloring pages. That's what we have this week. Um, if you do curbside and get the packet for the week. And okay. your prices will be in there. Yes. Uh, you have to ask for them. But yes. Uh, okay. No, that's what, that's what Miss Balkin said. Okay. And we will stop recording and we'll continue.